Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second plenary session of the International Hawk Congress 2014. My name is Jill Stanley. I'm the Vice President of IHC 2014 Organising Committee uh, in charge of the scientific programme. And I'll be your chair for this plenary session this morning. As you know by now, our theme of the Congress is horticulture, sustaining lives, livelihoods and landscapes. Yesterday, the plenary session focused on sustaining lives and the issue of global food security. The challenges of feeding the world, particularly within increasing megacities, whilst at the same time there's a significant part of the population which is undernourished. And we looked at the vision for solutions to these issues. Today, we continue the sustaining theme of sustaining lives, but this time the focus is on plants for health. And we have two outstanding speakers to address these uh, very different aspects of this. This plenary session is joint between International Hawk Congress and the Fifth World Congress on Medicinal and Aromatic Plants. Currently, a lot of new research is focusing on the benefits of fruit and vegetables and other plants for health. Understanding the mechanisms that control the way in which our food interacts with our bodies, either to keep us healthy or to help us when we have certain health issues. Yet in many cultures around the world, knowledge of the use of plants in medicine has been developed over centuries and has been passed down generations for hundreds or even thousands of years. Our first speaker this morning will tell us more about how some of this traditional knowledge is being combined with current science to make significant progress in utilising the plants for health and other purposes. The first speaker is Associate Professor Joanne Jamie. She's a bioorganic and medicinal chemist and Deputy Head of the Department of Chemistry and Biomolecular Science at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. As co-director of the Indigenous Bioresources Research Group, she has established collaborative research partnerships with Indigenous people on customary medicinal floral knowledge for cultural preservation, health care and drug discovery. Please welcome Joanne Jamie. Thank you very much, Jill. I'd like to thank the organising committee for this opportunity, and I would especially like to thank Myrna Deseo and Michael Hunrick from WACMAP for also being involved in my invitation. So today I'm going to give you some information related to my research as traditional medicinal partnerships. I hope through this you'll be able to see how rewarding it is to be able to work in partnership with Indigenous communities. So as Jill mentioned, I co-direct the Indigenous Bioresources Research Group. I'm a chemist, and the group is co-directed also by Subhavimal Pad, who's a microbiologist also from Macquarie University. And we work in what we believe is truly collaborative partnerships with Indigenous people. And our aims include documenting first-hand traditional medicinal knowledge to help in the preservation of that knowledge and also undertaking chemical and biological investigations. And our focus is particularly on topical applications for skin infections, sores and wounds. We also have um, some work that we do on plants that are used for cancers as well. We have implicit within our work with our communities providing capacity strengthening opportunities to all of our Indigenous partners, which I'll highlight within this talk. I want to give you a little bit of an overview on the importance of traditional medicinal knowledge and I'll also highlight the research that we undertake as a whole and give you some case examples of collaborative partnerships, including some of our capacity strengthening opportunities. Traditional medicines, of course, is a very important resource, particularly from a medical context, but also from a cultural context as well. The World Health Organization, for example, defines traditional medicines as a sum total of the knowledge, skills and practices 
based on the theories, beliefs and experiences indigenous to different cultures, used in the maintenance of health as well as in the prevention, diagnosis, improvement and treatment of physical and mental illnesses. There are of course in developing countries many people that rely on traditional medicines as their primary health care. In Australia, particularly in remote communities, Indigenous people there also rely very much on traditional medicines as opposed to going to a Western doctor. And of course, globally, there's a greater interest in use of natural remedies, complementary and alternative medicines, and traditional medicines is becoming a greater interest in the wider community. The World Health Organization has as a major aim the preservation of traditional medicinal knowledge and also an aim of incorporating it into wider society for health benefits of all. When you look at plant-based medicines, so traditional medicines, they're in fact the most consistent successful source of novel drugs that are then used in um, clinical use currently. And indeed, when you look at current clinically used drugs, approximately 80% of pl all plant-derived drugs are actually discovered or were discovered through looking at traditional medicines, that is, human use of these medicines over the generations. We've actually had the traditional custodians of this knowledge, the indigenous people who've acted as scientists for us, filtering out plants and other resources that are not effective or toxic from those that are effective and non-toxic. So as a result, traditional medicines are a major resource for safe alternative medicines and the discovery of new drug-like molecules. I'm going to give you an example that many of you are quite familiar with. So artemisinin was isolated from the herb Artemisia annua. And this is a herb that, for example, in Chinese medicine has been used for over 2,000 years for treatment of fevers and chills, including for treatment of malaria. From the study of that plant, it led to artemisinin being isolated and in the present time, there are a number of artemisinin and derivatives that are the basis of our current treatment of malaria. From a chemistry point of view, when you look at the structure of artemisinin, it is a structure that no chemist would have dreamed up as a drug-like molecule. Um, but this really highlights the diverse range of novel compounds that you can get by looking at plants, and particularly those that have been used as traditional medicines. Additionally, when we look at the Artemisia genus, there are many Artemisia species that actually don't contain artemisinin and haven't been used in a traditional way for malarial treatment. And so this again highlights that if you can focus on traditional medicines, it allows you to identify some very important molecules for medicine and health care. In the Australian Aboriginal communities, Aboriginal people have used plants for thousands of years. They have one of the oldest cultures and they therefore have a really vast knowledge of traditional medicines and of their flora. And in Australia, we're one of the 17 most biodiverse countries and we have many endemic plants to Australia and specific regions where this traditional medicinal use um, is the case. So there is also from a biodiversity point of view, some really interesting knowledge by the indigenous people. As I mentioned before, medicine is used as traditional medicines by um, many of our remote indigenous communities as their primary health care. We believe it's really important to conserve this knowledge and understand it not only just for its value in healthcare and drug discovery, but for its cultural value and also for education. Just to give you a little set of examples of the relevance of Australian traditional medicines, I've got some information here from um, some recent reviews that we did on New South Wales bush medicines is what I'm going to call them, or customary medicines. In fact, customary medicines is really the more respectful term for traditional medicines because it's in recognition that Australian Aboriginal people and Indigenous people worldwide have a constantly evolving knowledge. They combine traditional and contemporary knowledge in their use of their medicines. We found from this review that the plants that we commonly consider as important Australian um, plants came up consistently as these traditional customary or bush medicines, including from Acacia, Carimbia, Eucalyptus, Aromophila and Melaleuca. A little bit different to some cultures is that we don't have within the Australian Aboriginal communities use of, say, ethanol tinctures. Um, the plant material is often used crushed, heated, 
as a topical poultice infused or decocted in water and very often applied topically for a range of skin conditions. Some plant material is also drunk or the steam is inhaled, um, but from our particular review, topical application was more common. We also see sap being used and orally leaves, twigs and eating fruit taken for general health care. There are a wide range of ways these plants are used as medicines. So very often used for sores and skin complaints. Toothache, coughs and congestion, sore ears and eyes and stomach aches. Diarrhea and constipation, not at the same time and not necessarily from the same plant. Fevers, aches and pains. There's a wide range of biological activities. Many of these are relevant to important human diseases and infections. So for example, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant activities. What's also very important, there's a great diversity of natural products that are found in these plants. Again, highlighting the value of looking at our bioresources as a source for diverse molecules. And for many of these plants, their biological activities and their bioactive compounds are very strongly aligned with the castor medicinal uses by the Aboriginal communities. Of course, this is a classical example that shows the value of this customary knowledge. So Melaleuca alternifolia, or tea tree, is used customarily for treatment of abrasions, cuts and sores. And of course, it's very well known, tea tree oil is commercially used for its antibacterial and anti-inflammatory properties. We also see that many of the New South Wales medicinal plants have been used across the globe as traditional custom medicines, and very often in very similar ways, which I think really highlights the important knowledge of the Indigenous people where you've got customs across the world that are finding independently the medicinal value of these plants in a similar way. So when we look at Indigenous customary medicinal knowledge, it is of cultural value. There's obviously more and more interest these days in understanding Indigenous cultures and it is of a great significance in healthcare and drug discovery as I've shown. But it's also of important economic value if handled right, particularly for Indigenous people, so the custodians of this knowledge. There is a really very big issue though. This knowledge in Australia and across the world is rapidly disappearing. And this is predominantly because of the way this knowledge is transmitted within many of the Australian Aboriginal communities. We find that there's oral transmission of the knowledge from an elder respected for holding on to that knowledge to new elders. And as a result, there are very specific people that have this knowledge. And we found um, very sadly within the communities that we work with, quite a significant passing of elders with that knowledge and that loss of that knowledge. There are also communities that are being dislocated and westernised, which we see happening a lot within the Australian Aboriginal communities. So there must be a lot of effort to conserve this knowledge and understand its medicinal potential and to look at assisting in the well-being of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Because much of this knowledge is of plants that are endemic to Australia, it also has an important biodiversity significance. And by understanding the value of these resources can help us in the conservation of these plants as well. So the role of myself and my colleagues within the Indigenous Bioresources Research Group includes assisting in the conservation of this knowledge with specific communities, understanding the medicinal properties by doing some basic biological and chemical studies, but also importantly, giving back to communities to help in their overall wellbeing. We follow ethical guidelines, we follow best ethical practices where it's very much about the Indigenous people that we're working with being our partners. We are not researching them, we're working collaboratively together to come up with opportunities for each of us. We have developed collaborative agreements that of course respect that the ownership of the customary knowledge is that of the communities. Every aspect that comes out from biology and chemistry is in joint ownership and we have it implicit within our agreements that we're looking at benefit sharing and capacity strengthening. I'm just going to show the ways we go about this. So our study is an ethnobotanical study to start off with to help us in documenting and preserving 
the customary knowledge. So we work face to face with the elders within our communities and we look at the way they use the plants, when they collect the plants, um, whether they're mature or juvenile parts of the plants, the application methods and also the ailments treated. Sometimes that's quite interesting because we have different understanding of what the ailments may actually be and it's important together to work out what the likely conditions are. So often there are aids to help see whether it might be antibacterial origin, antifungal, um, sorry, of a fungal origin or bacterial origin, for example. We, wherever possible, work with the communities and employ community members for collecting the plant material and look at the extracts being prepared in the customary way. Our assays are aligned with the customary uses. So, for example, a lot of the plant material is used for healing of sores, skin irritation, skin infections. So we look at antimicrobial assays. There's also use of the plants for decreasing swelling, redness and pain. So we look at anti-inflammatory assays as well as also antioxidant. We've had some work also looking at anti-proliferative assays for plants that have been used for treating of cancers. And we do have one of our aspects of being to understand what the bioactive compounds are and also that the crude preparations themselves are bioactive. I'm going to showcase three partnerships that we have. These are with the Yagal Aboriginal people of Northern New South Wales, Australia, with a CIDA medical practitioner, Dr. The Morgan, who's on the right-hand side of the second picture. He's pictured there with his guru, who's in the traditional gear and former president of India. And also we work with Chumtia villages of Nagaland, which is northeast India. So Siddha is an ancient medical system um, of India and Dr. Vermorgan comes from Chennai in South India and he has over 30 years of experience working in a clinical setting to treat people with these Siddha medicines for cancers and conditions related to inflammation. And he contacted us to undertake some chemical and biological investigations on his plants. And I'm going to introduce you just to one of these plants and actually keeping it confidential as part of our collaborative agreement. So as is the case with a number of the plants that Dr. Vermorgan looks at, he dries the plant materials, often taking various parts of the plant. So in this case, he looks at dried root and leaf powder. And he treats the cancer patients by them then taking capsules orally. This particular plant has been used elsewhere for various um, traditional customary practices, but not for the treatment of cancers. For this particular mixture, we looked at an aqueous ethanol extract and then looked at human neuroblaster cell lines. And we do an assay known as the MTT assay. And MTT, methyl tetrazoleum salt, is actually a, a colourless um, compound that when you've got viable cells, be it as part of cancer cells or as part of bacteria, it gets converted to a purple formazin. So we do microtita plate assays where we've got our test sample, so in this case, this particular ethanol extract and OMTT and our cell lines. And we've actually seen that based on the National Cancer Institute recommendations for crude extract activity, that the IC50 of this particular plant extract was very, very promising. So we looked at this further, doing classical chemistry techniques, petitioning and chromatographic methods, and isolated several compounds, including rutin, apigenin, glucoside, scotolurin, luteolin and chrysoriol, which all were found to have anti-proliferative properties. And so they supported the use that Dr. Vermogen um, has with them being used for cancer patients. In the case of Nagaland, we work with elders from Shungtia village. And Nagaland is northeast India. It's actually within the Indo-Burma biodiversity hotspot, an amazing biodiversity of plants. And we worked with a Chungtia man, Meza, who contacted us to do a PhD to look at his medicinal plant use of his village. And his elders and the local authorizing body gave him the approval to do so. He established the collaborative partnerships and conducted the ethnobotanical, biological and chemical investigations. And as a result, has helped to document 135 medicinal plant uses. Um, he became the first PhD doctor of his village as well. And they made a really big thing of this. They were very proud of his achievements. He worked with 10 elders of Chungtia village that were recognized by the communities as the elders with the greatest customary knowledge. 
And this resulted in the documentation of the 135 medicinal plants comprising 69 families and 123 genera. So showing the biodiversity of these. He's developed a rather comprehensive bush medicine handbook that the communities are using as an important resource, both culturally and educationally. The conditions themselves that these medicines are used for include many gastrointestinal problems and also skin-related conditions. And one I find quite interesting coming from Australia where this is not actually an issue was the fact that they're used for such things as tiger bite. So we again do assays that are based on MTT um, and also just diffusion assays. And we found that many of the plants that are used topically for skin-related treatments have very good antibacterial activity. We look at Staphylococcus aureus, E. coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Salmonella typhimurium, Candida albicans, and with our Staph aureus, sensitive and resistant strains. Now this is not really for looking at the detail, but to show that from one of the plants that we looked at, we found a great diversity of natural products. And these are results from um, particularly the Staphylococcus aureus testing with MIC values next to them. And so we saw isoflavones, pterocarpins, and flavonones. And many of these had activities that were quite comparable to Corum phenicol, a known antibacterial agent. A number of these were reported for the first time, so C2 and C3 from this genus. And the compound C4, C5, C6, C7 from this species. And further, these compounds are also new for this species. And all the compounds bar one that I've just listed there of that whole host had good antimicrobial activity. So this just really highlights the diversity of compounds that you can get from just this one plant alone and help to really support its use within the communities. I want to particularly highlight a very strong partnership that we've had with Yagal Elders. And Yagal Elders are based in northern New South Wales and they contacted us about a decade ago to ask particularly in the preservation of their customary knowledge and also to look at some of the biology and chemistry. They also asked us to help in the educational benefits of their youth. So we interviewed the elders that were regarded as the custodians of the customary knowledge and over a number of times of interviews over several years and, and looked at the medicinal plants that were most commonly used by them. And we see again that there's a lot of plants that are used for skin related conditions, so boils, sores, wounds, antiseptic wash for example a number that are used for coughs, colds, and general tonics. Our work with the communities is, as I said before, joint with the communities. The ethnobotanical study has been jointly authored, and probably something that's even more of a pride to our communities is we've developed a Yagel Medicinal Plant Resources Handbook, and the picture here shows Uncle Ron, myself, and one of the PhD students launching that handbook into the community in 2011. And this handbook is used by the communities as a tourism resource, so they sell it, and then they can print more copies of the booklets, and it's lodged within the local museum, within the local library, within the school, and used within the school education system as well. We, of course, have tested um, plants that have been used for skin infection, sores, wounds, and antiseptics um, by the Yagel people. And we see, again, quite a high hit rate of plants that have high antibacterial activity, supporting the use by the communities. I'm just going to give you one example. This is a plant that's used by several Aboriginal communities, Alphatonia excelsa, or soap tree. And this is used as a hand, hand wash and for sore eyes. And it actually has lots of saponins in it. So when you rub your hands with a little bit of water in the leaf, it all soaps up. And this, we found, has very good antimicrobial activity against streptococcus pyogens, Staphylococcus aureus, including resistant strains, as well as showing some anti-inflammatory and antioxidant activities. And we have a number of flavonoids that we've isolated from this particular plant. We've also developed a database called the Custom Medicinal Knowledge Base, and this has a public section which incorporates a lot of information already in the public domain, 
on the ethnobotanical as well as chemistry and biological data on customary medicines around Australia. We also have a community database component which has been recently revamped and this week with elders that we're meeting up within a few days time we'll be um, finalising that for them to use as their own resource. So it's been developed in a way that it can be used within the community. It's protected such that it's their choice as to who accesses that information. Um, but they're particularly interested, particularly in the Yagel community, of using it within education. When we're looking at traditional medicines, it really is of great importance to the Indigenous people that we've worked with for it to be recognised by wider communities of the value of this knowledge. We've seen it to be a very empowering thing when we've been able to show the communities that the plants that they're using for treatment of skin infections have good antibacterial activity as an example. They find this really quite empowering in showing the value of their knowledge. So it's not validating it, but it's supporting what they know is important about their plants. And as I said, there are a number of communities in Australia that use custom medicines as their prime medicine source. So also documenting and having some scientific support of the benefits can en enable informed decisions by including local health agencies and remote communities. There is enormous benefit to communities themselves. So our Yagel communities are quite entrepreneurial. As I said, they are, for example, selling the Bush Medicine Handbook. Um, they have developed a um, tour around their local community showing all their bush foods and bush medicines. They're also currently very, very keen to make soaps, lotions, and, and other local products as a bit of a cottage industry. One of the big things that the elders asked us to do, which was something that was not actually expected being a chemist looking at their bush medicines, was that they said, we want you to help us help our youth. And they particularly asked us in using our expertise as scientists and educators to give Indigenous youth the aspiration to complete the high school education and go on potentially to further studies. Some of you may not be aware, but in Australia, there is quite a, dis a difference in retention of Indigenous youth at schools and non-Indigenous youth. And um, there has been work towards closing that gap. But this request came to us before closing the gap was an issue. And so we've now developed from this, we took to heart their question, can you help us help our youth? We've developed from this a National Indigenous Science Education Program with the Yagal Elders as partners, but also now a number of other community members, um, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal school communities and universities and science outreach organisations. And this places Indigenous students in leadership positions and promotes science and further education opportunities for them. Our activities include such simple things as running science shows, where we have um, very household-related items, such as using betadine to make pictures appear and then vitamin C to make them disappear, or showing the microbial world. But we use our university students and myself and colleagues to train the Indigenous youth at schools to run the science activities to younger students. And this is just one of the many things that we do, but this creates role models. The younger students see Indigenous students being important role models, being leaders, and then those students see the university students as role models as well. We have a lot of data to support that this is a really important way of capacity strengthening and providing aspirations. And in the case of McLean High School, which is where the Yagel Elders are based, they've had a really significant change in the retention of their youth within the schools. And we see Indigenous students being leaders at the schools and going on to further education. What really is important and I think um, very wonderful to see is from the elders saying, can you help us help our youth? It's come full circle. They've developed a cultural immersion program in their local school where they take out all the year seven students onto country and talk about their bush foods and their bush medicines and their middens and their stone axe making and various other cultural aspects. And we've helped in developing the resources with them on this. And all the year seven students since 2010 have been a part of this program. And for many of them, it's been the first time that they've actually met with Aboriginal elders from their community and learnt about their culture. It's developed enormous respect with the Yagal elders and the communities. And something that I find really wonderful with this is Uncle Ron, who's been involved in the program from the start. He said a while ago, 
and it's very sad to hear this, but he had to walk through the back door. And now he walks through the front door with pride as the community respect his knowledge and what he's given back to them. Uncle Ron is also very soon going to get an honorary PhD from Macquarie University, so we're very delighted by that. So we look at Kasmi Medicines as an important resource from a cultural education, healthcare and economic benefit point of view. We have established some really beautiful relationships with Indigenous people and we're guided by what they want out of this work. The ethnobotanical studies have helped us in preserving valuable traditional knowledge and providing some support to the traditional and customer uses that they have. We provide a capacity strengthening opportunities, including the Bush Medicine Handbook, which is very important for the communities that we work with, including helping assist them in developing a cultural immersion program and the National Indigenous Science Education Program, amongst other aspects. So I would like to acknowledge other members of my research group. We've also worked with colleagues to help train us up on some of the assay methods. Des Richardson and Danuta Kalinowski um, helped us with the anti-proliferative assays, which our, then, our students then um, worked with, and Hans Vonleth, um, who helped us with the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory assays. But most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge our indigenous research partners. They are the ones that have this enormous knowledge and it's very generous that they're giving us the opportunity to help look at it. And we have a responsibility to ensure that we handle that knowledge appropriately and give back as much as we can to the community with various capacity strengthening opportunities. They are our partners, they are our friends. We feel part of a really lovely community with the work that we've done with them. And that in itself has been extremely rewarding. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Joanne, for that uh, inspiring and stimulating talk. I think um, it's not only the partnership in developing and understanding the science from the scientists way back thousands of years, but also the cultural and the educational aspects that makes this so empowering and um, powerful. So I, we have some time for some questions. Um, there should be uh, some microphones if anyone would like to come up and ask a question? Yes, down in the front there. Uh, dear Professor Joni, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And my name is Zheng Li, I came from China. Uh, I very appreciate your research which combines culture and science because for human health, it was a very complex research object, which related to the people's body, mind, and emotion. Obviously, plants can promote human health by improving our physical and mental. Um, in recent years, there was a new uh, doctrine about live and uh, electromagnetic tickers. Electromagnetic um, it was said that there are energy transfer among life. Um, so they guess that uh, plants could promote health by not only supplying elements human needed, but also by transmitting energy and uh, information waves. Uh, my question is, do you think this doctrine of plants and health could to be researched further in the future? Thank you. All right. Um, thank you for that question. So um, obviously it's an area looking at it from an energy point of view that's um, beyond my expertise as a chemist. But I think that um, there is a lot of value in recognising things more holistically. So be it looking at from an energy context, but also um, just general belief. There is, um, within a number of communities we work with, you know, they look at their plant use very holistically. And I think that there's um, a lot of faith in that use that's important in itself, um, which I think is the case with use of a number of medicines. So there is often stories and um, 
superstition may not be the right word, but stories that relate to the plant use. And, and yes, the terms energy comes up quite a lot, both um, within the Australian Aboriginal communities and also within the Siddur and other practices as well. So it, it is an area that warrants further investigation. It's outside of my expertise. I like to look at the small molecules. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yves. My name is Yves Desjardins, I, I'm from Canada. Uh, I would be interested in knowing uh, if, uh, since we know that pharmaceutical industry is running short of good molecules, so what type of uh, collaboration do you have with, with uh, larger industries and are they investing in the, the, the different communities? Okay, so we're particularly interested, as I mentioned, in a more cottage industry base with our communities, as in that's what they want. I mean, obviously, there's potential in pharmaceutical industries when you're looking at Aboriginal medicines and, and other Indigenous medicines. For us, that's actually not um, what they're requesting, but we have a number of local healthcare organisations that have a very strong community perspective that want to help in developing formulations and actually want to go about um, workshops. We're actually looking at talking about that on Saturday with some of our communities. So, so that the communities can sell them more as um, general healthcare products. Um, I think in the context, particularly with some of the Indian um, medicines that we're looking at, there is um, greater novelty of structures. And, and that's where there's, um, I think, greater potential from a pharmaceutical drug development point of view. But at this stage, we're keeping it at a scale that is what our communities want, which is local benefits to them. Thank you. Yes. Yes, uh, Dr. Jamie, thank, thank you so much for the excellent presentation. I have a question. Um, um, I'm wondering whether you have uh, looked at the molecules which could be um, uh, not as useful or could be even dangerous for human consumption, especially for, for people who are uh, drinking uh, or, or chewing. Because personally, I, I'm interested in also uh, uh, using uh, them, but I want to make sure that some of these uh, do not have um, yeah. undesirable molecules. Thank you. Thank you. That, that is a, absolutely a, a, a very important question. Um, in the case of our applications um, with the Australian Aboriginal communities, they're topical, so we're not looking at oral issues. But in the case of one of our indigenous partner, um, one of our Indian partnerships, we've actually looked at a, a plant taken orally, where one of the com components isolated is known to be a carcinogen, and so that's something that um, we've discussed together about um, making sure that there isn't that compound present in the material that's taken orally, and and that's quite an interesting case because it's of a vegetable that is eaten by many people, and it also is the basis of um, a slimming pill. Um, but recent studies have shown that it's got some really not terribly good compounds, and that's just as important to know what's toxic. Now, we don't look at toxicity as such as yet within our group, but we have a collaboration starting, um, we're very fortunate to have a hospital on campus who will be helping us to look at things from a cytotoxic point as well. Yeah, I apologize, forgot to... Um introduce myself, Abraham Firuzabadi from US. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I've got one question. Um, being a horticultural scientist, I'm interested in whether some of these um, plants that, that you d are, are being used, whether the de they're developed into cultivated plant plantations and um, uh, the, whether the communities are, are working on how to grow these plants in populations? Okay. So they're not looking at the cultivation at the moment. Um, in northern New South Wales, it's a really lush environment and there's quite a lot of the plants that they work most closely with. But as I said, they're very entrepreneurial, um, our Yagal elders, and um, we really want to explore those opportunities because they're very, very interested in economic benefits back to their particular communities. So I do think there is some scope. Good. Okay, I think we'll move on. So please join me in thanking Joanne for her great talk. Okay, we're, we're taking a slightly different uh, tack now. Uh, we all know that fruit and vegetables are healthy for us. I'm sure you all know. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. That's what our pet mothers told us. 
And we also all know that we should be eating five plus a day of fruit and vegetables. A recent study in the United Kingdom suggested that we should actually be eating eight plus a day. But are we even managing to eat five plus a day of fruit and vegetables? And if we know it's healthy for us, why aren't we doing it? And what can we do about improving this? So our next speaker is going to look at this particular issue. His name is Professor Tony Worsley. He's a professor of behavioral nutrition at Deakin University, Melbourne, Australia. He has 30 years experience in the evaluation of public health nutrition programs and in the promotion and maintenance of food behavior change. He's published widely in scientific and professional journals and has authored several books, including Nutrition Promotion, Public Health Nutrition, The Use and Abuse of Vitamins and Body Owners Manual. So uh, join with me in welcoming Professor Tony Worsley. Uh, thank you, Jill. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you can see, I've got a fairly provocative title. Um, I think you might hope by the end of this talk you might agree with me that uh, we have a problem. Um, what I'm going to do now is try to support the two plenary speakers yesterday. I'm going to be a bit of a contrast to Professor Jamie's talk on medicines, looking more at the prevention side. Um, so I'm going to give you really a, a bit of a quick tour of the main sites in public health, nutrition, and consumer behavior. So we'll have a look if I can get this going. Um, got a problem here. We don't seem to be getting this working. And is it on? Oh, right up, sorry. Me and technology, don't, don't mix. So we'll look at three sort of areas. We'll look at fruit and vegetable consumption and health. We'll move on to look at influences on consumers, particularly in consumerist societies. And we'll look at some strategies we can use to promote fruit and veg. Um, I'm having great trouble here. Any thoughts? I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Excuse me. <laughs> Is that it? Right. Okay. Okay, so first thing we'll try and look at um, fruit and vegetable consumption and health. And as was heard earlier, we all know fruit and vegetables are healthy, but do we really? Um, what other's going on? Ah, now. What I want to show you first is uh, results from the World Health Survey, which point out that if you look at low and, and middle income countries, about four out of five people do not eat recommended five servings of fruit and vegetables to, per day. The reasons for this were alluded to by Professor Fan yesterday. They're relating to poverty um, and things like poor storage and distribution systems and lack of investment. Right, if we look at affluent countries like the United States, and most of this talk will be about those consumerist markets, we'll see it's not much different, that only about 25% uh, of Americans and Australians and people in places like Chinese cities, coastal and large uh, mega, mega cities, uh, only about 25% have this five serves a day of fruit and vegetables. Um, If we look in Australia, where things are a little bit different, but probably Australia is a fairly typical sample of this consumerist world we live in, we see that about 40 to 50 percent, usually more women, are eating the two serves of fruit required by the nutritionists. I'm having great difficulty with this. <laughs> um, can you just have a look? Thank you very much. We'll get there eventually. Now, we'll just go back. 
if we look at servings of vegetables in Australia, and the Australians are a little bit different in that the nutritionists ask people to eat five servings of vegetables a day, not three, which is more usual worldwide. We see that at less than 10% are having the five servings a day. And if we look at how many having more than three servings, it's about 40%. So not a great show. When we look at how many people fit the Australian guidelines, which are seven fruit and vegetables today, it's less than 8%, and it peaks around 75 years of age. And this illustrates very much that vegetables are for older people. And as you track backwards, you'll see that there's less and less use of fruit and vegetables. Uh, when we get to the stage of children, and from the Australian Children's Nutrition Survey in 2007, you can see that for fruit in the top left corner, they're um, doing quite well, a, a lot of having uh, two fruit a day, but vegetables not very high. And by the time we get to the bottom right corner there, uh, and 14 to 16 year olds, you can see that only 5% are eating enough vegetables recommended amounts. And this basically is what one nutritionist in Australia said, vegetables are a threatened species. And we, we need to do something about it. It doesn't bode well for the future if our adolescents uh, are not eating vegetables. Uh, there are classes you can go to in Australia where children have not eaten a vegetable at all by the age of 12. And this is true in other countries. So when we look at fruit and vegetables and health, there's two angles to it. One is we, we have to always take into account the indirect impacts of fruit and veg production, that they create, it creates jobs in industry, and employment is one of the great uh, determinants of health. Health's not made by m medical or uh, uh, allied health people. It's made by other sectors, and employment's one key area. And you can see the effects of, of how important this is if something like a fruit, fruit packaging plant closes down in a country town, you'll usually see increased domestic violence, increased depression, suicide, and indeed increased incidence of uh, non-communicable diseases. So that's one angle which can't be underestimated. It's very important. Um, the other relationship is between vegetable consumption and uh, non-communicable diseases. We are at the moment in the world, globally, in a massive epidemic of non-communicable diseases, such as cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, some cancers, bowel cancer, so on, obesity, and dementia. And these are um, major problems. Um, if you look for obesity, 62% of Australians are either obese or overweight. Same in UK, same in Europe, even France. It's very similar. Um, so, Fortunately, there are great reports on the benefits of increasing fruit and vegetable, and I'll show you some of those, if I can get it. Now here, we're looking at the risk factors for premature mortality and loss of uh, productive life due to disability caused by uh, these, these non-communicable diseases. And this is a global picture, and you'll see there that the, risk, the main risk factor is high blood pressure and tobacco smoking. But I've, I've highlighted in the green arrows uh, where low fruit intakes, low vegetable intakes, low cereal grain intakes, fruits can come in. They are major risk factors for disease processes and the effect longevity and quality of life. Um, in Australia, the uh, nutritional related risk factors are the number one source of the burden of disease and it's overtaken tobacco smoking. So, when, we, when we're looking at evidence for fruit and vegetable relationships with health, there are two things we have to keep in mind, which are not always easy to do. One is we must see some plausible evidence of biological mechanisms. So we might be looking at things like um, inf inflammatory responses, and we, we'd want to see, particularly in experimental laboratory studies and vitro studies, evidence of that, so we understand what the mechanism is. Um, but also, we want to see population effects. So if we increase fruit and vegetable consumption, do we see a decrease in the non-communicable diseases? And, what sort, and this is very difficult to do. And it takes cohort studies lasting many years with many thousands of people in many in several sites, usually 10 or 20 sites across the world, to track this stuff. Because there are so many other things that can affect longevity and health outcomes besides fruit and vegetables. Um, very expensive work, very slow, but quite thorough. 
uh, we need more of this, more experimental trials of various um, approaches. Now, when you come to nutrition itself, there seems to be a bit of a shift going on, which is quite interesting. We've kind of got a micro shift to nutrigenomics and related things where we look at the effects of food constituents, not just nutri nutrients, but other bioactive compounds, which we heard about this morning. And they can have powerful effects. So there's a lot of work going on there, but you also need to see effects in the population. And in, that, in this respect, there's also an opposing trend, which is this shift from a depletion paradigm, which came out of undernutrition, which is still prevalent around the world, but also now we have, if you want, overnutrition, too much energy going into people. Um, so you'll start seeing, uh, the last 10 years, we've seen emphasis on dietary patterns. Um, we're shifting from studying just single nutrients, so that can be useful, to looking at dietary patterns, dietary quality, eating occasions like meals, um, meal number and timing of meals, and the energy density of food, food matrices, and so on. So there's a lot of change going on in nutrition itself. Um, these are not necessarily two uh, opposing trends, but sometimes it seems they are. Um, so plenty of evidence that healthy and unhealthy dietary patterns exist. And the typical thing we hear about is a prudent diet dietary pattern is that high in fruit and vegetables and cereal grains, low in, low in energy dense nutrient poor products, EDMP, often referred to these days. Cakes, biscuits, confectionery, sugar sweetened beverages versus the opposite of that, which is sometimes called a Western diet. And there's, starting again about 10 years ago, been a series of studies showing that people that follow this sort of prudent, high plant matter, um, fresh food diets um, tend to have less colon cancer, less of many other, uh, less lower hypertension, and so on. Um, quite a lot of evidence there. Typically, this can relate to um, the typical agrarian diet of the last 5,000 years or so, which was very plant-based, often with poverty. Uh, and the Mediterranean diet is an iconic diet, which is actually followed by very few people in the Mediterranean. Uh, but it sort of illustrates what an agrarian diet would have been like, which is lots of cereal grains, fruits, vegetables, legumes, and small amounts of oils, um, meats, and so on. And certainly not many cakes, biscuits, muesli bars, chocolate bars, soft drinks, in fact, none at all. Um, and the question is, do, does this make a difference? And there are several studies going on, such as the EPIC study, the European investigation into cancer and nutrition in 10 countries. Here's a Greek site report on 23,000 people between 20 and 86 years old who were followed up after eight and a half years. And the more they comply with that Mediterranean type diet score, and the Mediterranean diet is a handy name, but you can see it in Andean diets, see it in Okinawa diets. There's a lot of the traditional agrarian diets are very similar. Um, and you can see that people who, the more they fitted in with this diet score, the more longer they lived, basically. And high vegetable, high fruit and nuts, and high legumes were responsible for that. Similar findings have been shown in other countries in this study, also in some other studies like Seneca and food habits and later life, right across the world. So this sort of shift that's going on in nutrition towards foods and patterns of diet, dietary patterns, is now expressed in some of the advice nutritionists give to the um, public. And, um, so now we have food-based dietary guidelines and not nutrition-based as much as they used to, nutrient-based. And I'll just show them very quickly. So the first thing you'll see in the Australian guidelines is to try and maintain a healthy weight because of the obesity epidemic and non-communicable diseases. Be active. Choose amounts of nutritious foods and drinks to meet your energy needs. And then there's a long list of things you should be doing. And you can probably read there. And these are basically fresh primary industry products and lots of water and goes on to say, watch what you're eating, the amounts of saturated fat, salt, sugars, alcohol. Don't overdo it. Uh, encourage support, promote breastfeeding. Care for your food, look at the food safety issues. So those are kind of things that are being talked about right across the nutrition world. Here's a nice piece of religious art from the nutritionist. Um, 
you'll see these in every country, different shapes, pagodas in China and plates in the United States. Um, if you have a look at the very bottom right, there's a whole list of these um, energy dense, nutrient poor foods, which we used to say um, only have occasionally. Now we say don't have them. And so, you know, this is what they say, you must consume more of these foods and particularly restrict your intake of these foods. Now, these are the occasional foods that we could, you know, there's no harm in them. You know, having a glass of wine doesn't harm you. But if you have too much, same with meat pies and so on. The problem we're hitting uh, emerged about in 2010 when Rangan and Sydney show that when you looked at Australian children, 41% of the food they were taking in was this stuff. And it's true in other countries. And this is actively marketed right across the world. How do you change it? How do you get people to stop this? And this is where we come to need, we need to look at the influences on consumers. And um, I'll just try and give you a very brief overview of what's going on in, this in the cities of the world. Um, and we've seen this in the West over the last 50 years, but it's happening very rapidly in most countries. So we see one trend, and these are not causes, these are just manifestation of what's going on. We've seen maternal employment outside the home. So women taking jobs outside the home, usually because they have to. Um, and the time pressures this generates for the preparation of meals. In some countries, we've seen more single parent households, more dual income households, creates time pressures. Then there's a rise of convenience products. Just put it in the microwave and you'll be right. And with that is all the big food companies that have emerged. So um, the big retailers and the big um, food manufacturers across the world who tend to make highly processed foods, not always, they make some very good products too. Associated with all this is the de-skilling of the household food gatekeeper. They can't cook. Um, a backlash against Life skills education started in the 70s, quite rightly, which the traditional home economics was seen to be gendered and basically prescribing women's roles. Um, so there's a great reaction against that. Trouble is, nothing really replaced it. And then we're seeing an informalization of food practices where there are very few rules. You can watch, have your dinner watching the TV by yourself, away from the family. Um, you can eat any time of the day or night you want. It wasn't so, and I'll just show you a picture here from Britain in 1960s. If you look, look at the blue line, there were about three and a half main meals. And by 2001, there'd been glaciation. And you see a lot of grazing, eating all the way through the day. And that's what's happening in places like India and the affluent parts of China and so on. So we need to understand today's consumers. What are they on about? What are their needs and wants? And particularly, which contexts are they in when they purchase, prepare, and consume foods? And there are many ways to look at this. I won't bore you to death with this one. Here's, this is the simplest model I could find for you. It's a food-related lifestyle model. And you see on the right there, there's consumption. And there are various kinds of things that will influence consumption. And I've circled some of the um, main ones we might, that are really quite important. So, the meal preparation scripts and the shopping scripts are basically saying person's got to know how to prepare the meals and how to shop. Can they compare products you're reading the food label? For example, it's not what you know, it's how you know, what, how to do things. And then there are things like values and other motivating drivers, and there are different kinds of people. So there are a whole group of people, about 40% in Australian society, who are very other-oriented, caring for the other people, families, animals, planet, and they eat differently. They'll eat more fruit and vegetables than those who are more um, individualistically minded and on about achievement and so on. And then there's also the uses situation, which I've just mentioned. Things like what happens when you prepare the evening meal? What happens at the point of sale? Do you fall for impulse buying? So eating occasions, the meals and snacks and drinks are now becoming the focus of nutrition not just nutrients, and because people don't eat nutrients, and actually most of the time they don't eat individual foods, they may for a snack, but they eat combinations, and to put those combinations together takes time and effort. So 
if we, when we think this way, we've started to see in the United States, there are now two more eating occasions since 1995, and they haven't got any fruit and vegetables in them. They've basically got these high convenience snacks. Uh, in Australia, we don't think that's happening, but may or may not be. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work with Meat and Livestock Australia on the main evening meal, which is where most food is consumed in Australia. And we actually only, only found out in the last five years what people in Australia actually have for their main meal, which is, sounds strange. Um, and I'll just show you some of this um, Meat and Livestock uh, findings, because it gives you some idea what consumers are doing and, you, and to sell your fruit and veg to them, you need to understand this. So first, you can see here that about three quarters actually try every night to make food from fresh ingredients. Uh, sure, 10% will go outside and buy food, and some will use pre-cooked. But a lot of them are trying to, to cook fresh foods. And they actually, there's a kind of a love-hate relationship. They quite enjoy it. At the same time, it's very drud drudgery and boring. Uh, about 30% of men do this, by the way, uh, and that's the big change. And they do everything, including the washing up. But people don't plan very much. They plan on the day or the day before. In grandma's time, she might plan for the week, like Mrs. Beaton in her cookery book. She would have um, a long lead time. We don't, do it, have, don't have time for that. Uh, but they do have lots of vegetables in the main meal. Now, maybe Australians are a bit different, but there's a whole range of things. The question is, can you increase the number of vegetables? Uh, we've actually, here are some of the top 10 meals, and you can see they're having about three vegetables on, on average in those meals. Uh, we've actually asked people which kind of meals have a lot of vegetables and which kinds have very few, like fish and chips, curry, sausages and mash, a bit limited. Uh, could you increase the number of vegetables in there? Can you slip another vegetable in? Uh, what drives the meal choice? Um, well, basically, we health people would say, oh, it's all about health. Well, it's not really. And we find in our qualitative work that people mention health at the beginning of an interview and then leave it completely. They're on about convenience, doing it quickly, and being tasty. And because they have their child usually judging them as to how good they are. And you'll notice they spend quite a lot of time, over an hour every day, doing this. And if you've got two or three jobs, uh, and you've got to have the meal ready by six or seven, it's a big task. And that's probably why they're watching MasterChef, trying to get tips and to sympathize with the poor cook. So MLA have come up with a revised communication strategy, you know, build on the current repertoire and skills, see if you can increase it. Most people can only cook four or five meals. And they go through them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, then the finished and then go to the takeaway on Friday. On Saturday, it's everyone for themselves. And on Sunday, it's probably another traditional dinner. Uh, and on Sunday night, they might think a bit about what they're going to do this week. It gets boring, and they're always looking for interesting things to do. So the question is, could horticulture come and do similar things? Um, it's all about food transformation. The consumer is trying to take a raw food and make it into a meal. And I'm showing here some work from one of my PhD students, Julia Summers, looking at what over 60s think about when they're doing planning, purchasing, preparation, eating and disposal and storage. Storage and disposal are very important because in Australia we buy $5 billion worth of food every year and then throw it to, into landfill. You know, we put the vegetables in the fridge and forget about them until they rot and then we throw them out. So what can we do about that? Maybe better fridges that don't have any space for vegetables. Uh, and I'm showing here, using this same plan, how manufactured snacks like muesli bars and chocolate bars need far less effort and time to eat than fruit, which has to often be cut up and get messy, and especially vegetables. So this is what the consumer's having to do. Um, one other interesting um, eating occasion is that of toddlers between the main meals, where mothers might want, they'll, they'll be hungry, and might have a group of four-year-olds, five-year-olds coming to play together. What should we give them to eat? And one of our students at Wollongong, Courtney Weston, looked, compared mother's views of six common fruits with six common manufactured products, like uh, various lollies and cakes, ice cream. And she used a thing called repertory grid technique, uh, which simply puts random selections of these foods, like two fruit, mango and orange with ice donut, and asks people, what do you think's the odd one out? Which one? They might say ice donut. Why is that? Oh, it's artificial and the others are natural. 
and then you go on and mix up another three and ask people, say, which is the odd one out? You can't use the previous answer. And so if you drill down, you'll find out what people are really thinking about. And we use that to inform a, well, what you'll get first is pictures of perceptual maps, and this is a bit complicated, but if you look at the bottom right quadrant, you'll see their views of some of the fruits, and notice they have to be kept cold, they have to be cut up, whereas in the top left, the manufactured products are crunchy, and they can be easily stored and ready to eat. So what, when we moved on a bit, and we made a survey using these perceptions, and we asked people how important, asked mothers how important they are, in order, this is what they said, they said convenience is the most important thing. The food should be easy, accessible in supermarkets, no preparation, ready to eat, no cutting up. It should be satisfying for the child. It should fill them up, stop them groaning, stop them complaining. It should be a good snack, be appetizing, and provide energy. It certainly does that usually. Uh, it should be sociable, that kids will like it, you can share it. And then yes, good food, no additives. But it's, it's the convenience and satisfaction that matter. So, before we, I'll just uh, hurry up a little bit. Um, one thing we have been doing is a whole series of studies on the household gatekeeper. And this was in Mike Reed at RMIT University. And we've carried out qualitative interviews with uh, householders and asked them how they go about preparing their meals and how they, these, these household gatekeepers are the food providers for the household. Usually it's the woman or it may be a man and they are responsible for getting the food and often for preparing the meals. And they often make rules about what goes on in the household. And one thing that came out of this, and this is a lot of work we're reporting on this, but one thing that comes out all the way through these studies is that cooking confidence and nutritional confidence, actually being confident you know what you're doing, uh, knowing how to do things, it seems to be very important. So here's a bit of a cluster analysis where you can sort of say there's three groups, those with high, low, and moderate confidence, most people in the middle. And then when we look at various features of the household, things like prominence of fruit, um, the um, overeating, impulse buying at the shops, things like that. And what I've done here, you'll see there's a relationship with confidence. And this shows the strengths of association. And in green are the fruit and vegetables. So the prominence of vegetables, the variety of vegetables, the variety of fruit, things like that. And what you'll see typically is this kind of graph, that the more confident they are, the more they'll be eating fruit and vegetables. So why is confidence important? Because you can influence it you can actually get people to do a short cooking course. There's a lovely little course in Western Australia called Food Sense. It just has three lessons, and it's used on people who are illiterate, and they enjoy it immensely, and it gives them some basic skills about how to buy food, how to work out the best bargains, and how to prepare some foods. So there's a lot of things you can do, especially today with the internet. Okay, all this brings me to um, what can we do about this to stop the decline? And obviously, you can probably do it at three interrelated areas, consumers, industry, and government. At the consumer level, a lot of people are pointing out you need to inform, inform consumers about convenience, taste, enjoyment, and versatility. What that really means is that you've got to promote your products to, so as to help the consumer do what they have to do, get the meal on the table by 7 o'clock. And again from MLA, they want to know how do you make inexpensive but tasty meals? How do you add a new tasty meal to the repertoire? Can you give me a good recipe I can try? How do I prepare my meals quickly after work? How, and then health comes in, seasonal availability. How do I reduce our, my food waste? So people are on about it. So you've got to talk to that. Not say it's healthy. They know it's healthy. And it doesn't really matter very much. Health really matters for parents of young children and people over 60 or people with diseases. It's really important. But otherwise, health is something we take for granted, which is probably how it should be. Um, probably we shouldn't be too factual or puritanical. We should appeal to emotion and aspirations and their habits. So, for example, in Australia, a lot of consumers think farmers are terrific. They don't know what they do, they don't know any, but they think they're wonderful people. And so that should be used in marketing. And things like provenance, you know, this pear was grown on a tree that's 100 years old. It's really unusual. People like that, and so on. Um, 
we should get behind skills education with the collapse of home, the old home economics. There's a new one now, and this is called food literacy. And there's a big education movement about that. If you look at most school curricula, they're pretty awful. There's, in Australia, there's some great primary school curriculum. Stephanie Alexander uh, Kitchen Garden Scheme teaches children to actually grow foods and then how to use flavoring agents and how to substitute um, various flavors to make a meal. Uh, we need more of that. It needs to go through secondary right up to university. We need to support household gatekeepers with communication systems, online discussion groups. They enjoy it immensely. SMS messaging just as about shopping. You know, give them a shopping list. Help them. Do some nudging. You know, the marketers of the energy-dense nutrient-poor foods do everything they can. I'm in my hotel room today, and I can see the muesli bars just lying there waiting for me to eat them. They're nudging me. Why can't you do that with fruit and vegetables? It's harder, I know, but we should be trying to do things like that. Industry. I think what I'm, the whole point of this talk is to show you that the health community, the public health community, the medical community, as well as environmental and consumer organizations, think fruit and vegetables are terrific and absolutely essential. So we need to partner with each other. At the moment, certainly in this country, we don't really lobby together. Public Health Association has lobbyists in Canberra. The Australian Medical Association has lobbyists. We need to be working with them so we have a common platform to tell government and others how important this stuff is. And okay, within the supply line, there are lots of recommendations coming out of places like Rabo Bank, keeping inferior quality off the shelf, trying to get short, dedicated supply lines, and based, most of all, to stop infighting between our members. So it's a bad look. What can industry do itself? Well, it could help to reduce the inconvenience and make preparation easier. You know, chop up, sell, as is happening already. Um, the Swedes give veggie bags to people where you can make several meals out of the vegetables, boxed vegetables, um, pre-prepared vegetables, chopped up vegetables. So it's easier, saves time. Or if we take the dark view and say oh, people may never learn skills, you could say, well, perhaps we do have to go into the business of making high quality meals and do away with meal preparation. Some of the UK supermarkets are doing quite nice jobs there. And also we must get into the snack food business. And Project Harvest, which Ozvesh runs, uh, gives lots of examples of vegetable and fruit snacks. But above all, we've got to engage in marketing because everyone else is marketing. And your main competitors are these energy-dense, nutrient-poor foods, which are now taking around half of our diet. And we have to hit back on that. So we need strategic, concerted responses to our competitors. What can government do? Government has a very big role. Um, firstly, it should allow primary industries generally to market their products with few restrictions. That's not always the case. We need to probably carry on awareness raising. If you think of what Julian was talking about yesterday, we need to make sure everyone knows about the possibilities for the future and how valuable horticultural products are. Education campaigns are very important. We need good education. I don't agree with um, Mr. Cribb's view that we should have a year of food. I think we need food in the curriculum all the way through. It's very, very important. You've got to watch education campaigns of any sort, because politicians often get their fingers on them, and they're quite happily spend several million dollars for photo opportunities, and then drop it. And we have a lot of examples in Australia of very good projects, like Fresh Taste in, in New South Wales schools, which went really well, started to change uh, children's preferences towards horticulture, and then after three years, the government dropped it. And this happens again and again, um, so we've got to watch it. People are very in favor of these things. Um, preferential purchasing, when government controls institutions like hospitals and jails, you can actually follow the data guidelines and sell, hold, promote, provide horticultural products. And finally, if you copy the Danes and Norwegians, you can provide free fruit and vegetables in certain places. To, but that would take subsidies. Uh, most consumers are in favor of that, not the others are not. And finally, we need to remember that all this fruit and vegetables are about public interest. It's in our interest economically and health-wise. If we want to avoid the situation where something like 40% of us may become type 2 diabetics, with all that entails, a slow, long, lingering life with no productivity, 
we want an enormous public expense, we're going to have to say fruit and vegetable consumption is a national priority. So we need to change things like competition policy, control of buying power of retailers, and regulation of junk products. We need a lot of change there. So my last slide, you'll be glad to know, is the conclusions are very simple. There are very good health and economic reasons to increase fruit and vegetable consumption. Consumers are sovereign. You've got to understand what they're about. I've only shown a little bit. And we need to partner with other allied agencies. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tony, for another very um, stimulating talk. I think it really brings home to me that we can only make progress in um, improving fruit and vegetables consumption by understanding the behaviours of people and then using that to develop the um, ways to improve that. So I'd like to ask for questions from the floor. Yes. Uh, my name is Olaf van Koten from the Netherlands. Uh, thank you for that enlightening talk. Um, you make clear that uh, a lot of things have to change uh, and that we should make the right choice the easy choice, basically. Mm -hmm. However, as I see it, there is a big clash between the ultimate uh, profitability of, of having better food and eating be better eating habits in our society, economically as well, and the principle in most of these consumer societies of a free marketplace. Because yeah. yeah. as far as I can see, uh, the, 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 the concept of a free marketplace really induced the food industry to shove as much sugar, yeah. fat yeah. and salt into our bodies as possible. Now, how do we change that? Very good question. If we hadn't knew the answer to that, we wouldn't be here. Uh, absolutely spot on. Um, I think basically uh, it's a slow process. Firstly, there are damages caused by oversupply of certain products, which taxpayers have to pay for. So free market's very good as long as everyone pays the costs. So that's one issue. Um, the other issue probably relates to food policy and support for it. And there's some recent work in New Zealand from Penny Field and University of Otago, which looked at the, basically the collapse of New Zealand food and nutrition policy, particularly about uh, TV advertising to children. And what she points out is that over 20 years, the people involved were all lead um, stakeholders. They were government uh, officials, people from the Hart Foundation, university academics, and so on. And when a minister came along who didn't believe in any of it, they had no effect at all. Heart Foundation found it very difficult to be too critical because a lot of its funding comes from the government. And she points out that unless you get consumers on side and they're well informed, you won't get much change when you've got these difficult problems. So her argument really is that you need to build up a consumer constituency and this is education and awareness building. And they're the people that ring up the MPs. They're the people in the Rotary Club who say, hey, this isn't good enough, we better change it. So it's a very difficult problem. All sorts of ways to deal with it. Okay, yes, next. Yeah. My name is Bhimu Patil from uh, Texas A&M University in Texas. Uh, it's an excellent talk. My question to you is, as a scientist, from horticulture to the medical science and nutrition and including in School of Public Health, are we confusing the consumers by providing an immediate information without the proof of the concept? That's why the consumption in the United States is still 2.2 servings per day, even with 20 years of encouraging increasing fruits and vegetable consumption. Are we con confusing the consumers, is my question. Yeah, I think... So again, do, you need, do you need more information from the cell culture to the human studies? Yeah. While I agree that fruits and vegetables are good for health, but yeah. are we confusing the consumers like coffee is good for one day and the next day is yeah. not good for you? Yeah. I think this is the free market in ideas. So, you know, New England Journal of Medicine brings a paper out on a Friday, and by Saturday, all the world's media have got it. And so every week we see another major, stunning breakthrough as coffee's bad or it's good, and so on. I th again, I think it comes back to having proper... Um, first, you're quite right, we need to have a 
much simpler point of view, and I think that's why talking about foods and food patterns is a lot easier because that's what consumers do. They're not nutritionists. And we need to actually back that up with really good um, education programs, long-term, slow-burning things. I think you're right. A lot of our science has actually led to quackery. So, you know, overemphasis on a particular nutrient, ignoring all the context in which it's eaten. So we need to start better communication, basically. But absolutely right. We can confuse, often do. Yes, question here. Hi, I'm David Chanier from New Zealand. Um, you didn't mention um, the, 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 what, what retailers, food retailers do in, um, in these decisions. Uh, for example, um, I mean, when, when you enter a supermarket, usually the first uh, shelf that you hit is fruit and vegetables, and maybe that's, you know, a good way for people to bypass that, that stage in the supermarket. And, I mean, you mentioned, you know, the importance of marketing, but um, you can have a fantastic label and a fantastic product, but if you don't get the proper shelf space, it might be you yeah. know, totally lost. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. And the, it's the retailers who are the choice editors. They decide what will be sold. So, so that to their, in favor, to their credit, uh, in several countries, they push fruit and vegetables more strongly now than they used to. There's a lot of money in it, as you know. Um, and get the, these are problems, and that's why you need to band together with your medical and public health colleagues to make stronger cases. And we need to build up a lot more um, groundswell of public opinion as to how things will, will change to create demand for our products. But you're dead right. Okay, one more question down the bottom here. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I need to appreciate the fact that the uh, problems of obesity are no longer the Western problems. In Africa, yes. obesity is increasing also at 40% every 10 years. My, my question is, uh, what is the contribution of not eating adequate fruits and vegetables to obesity and lifestyle diseases compared to other causal agents? Or causes. Okay, so your question is, what's the contribution of fruit and vegetable not eating them to obesity? Um, well, I think a lot, there's certainly an energy dilution effect if you eat fruit and vegetables. It doesn't leave so much room for the other products. So that's one factor. Um, that's probably the main factor, that they're full of nutrients and have low amounts of energy. So if you can get people eating them, they'll be having less energy, less surplus energy than um, otherwise. So I think that's part, part of the uh, benefit of the vegetables. But that's a matter of research as to how they actually operate. And we don't really know. You'll find a lot of public health talks about fruits and vegetables. And if you're lucky, they might talk about root vegetables, but they don't distinguish between vegetables. They're looking at them as a category. OK, thank you. That's I'd like to now introduce Professor Ian Warrington, who's co-president of the Congress, and Elizabeth Smith, who is a member of our organising committee, to thank the two speakers. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. When we planned this Congress, we wanted to be absolutely certain that it was beyond any doubt that you had arrived at a horticulture event. And from the front doors of this convention center to this room, to the foyer, to the exhibition center, we've tried to provide you with a festival of horticulture at its best in a social context, in a context which makes you feel comfortable in an indoor concrete jungle, and to admire the beauty of horticulture that objective sounds very simple, but you need a good person to deliver that message. If it's green, she delivered it. If it's colorful in the front, she organized it. If it's beautiful beside me on the stage, she arranged it. Ladies and gentlemen, the person that came up on stage with me is Elizabeth Smith, and she's responsible for those garden displays that you've seen in the exhibition. Could you join with me in thanking her for her efforts?
these plenary sessions were organized to challenge you with new ideas, to, to, to broaden your horizons, to introduce you to concepts beyond your narrow field of specialization, to introduce you to ways in which horticulture can relate to other disciplines. And this morning, as of yesterday, we've had two excellent speakers that have done that for you. We would like to thank them in a very creative way, and we, in order to do that, we're presenting them with an original work of art. That art was commissioned from a, a, a local Aboriginal artist called Narelle Urquhart. She has produced wonderful images of uh, indigenous Australian flora that, are, that is used for human consumption and for medicinal, aromatic <coughs> for medicinal and aromatic applications. How more appropriate could that be for our two speakers this morning? If you want to see some of that art, it is arranged decoratively around the monitor screens in the poster displays. But without further ado, I'd invite uh, Elizabeth Smith to present the two paintings that we have this morning to our guest speakers and invite you to thank them for the contributions that they've made in this session. Thanks, Thanks, <clears throat> I'd also like to present the ISHS medal and certificate uh, to Jules Stanley, who's been uh, your MC this morning. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. 